The Witch of Blackbird Pond Chapter 16, Part 2 Does thee plan to marry him? She asked gently. I, I don't know. They all expect me to. Does thee love him? How can I tell, Hannah? He's good, and he's fond of me. Besides, Kit's voice was pleading, If I don't marry him, how shall I ever escape from my uncle's house? Bless thee, child, said Hannah softly. Perhaps tis the answer. But remember, thee has never escaped at all if love is there. Presently, Kit opened the door to Prudence's timid knock and was comforted by the pleasure that rushed into the child's face. Prudence had further news of the culprits. Nat won't be able to come and see you, she told Hannah. They marched the three of them straight to the landing and put them on the dolphin. But Nat waved to me as he went by. You know Nat? Kid asked the child, surprised. Of course I know him. He comes to see Hannah. Last time, he listened to me read. Why should it disturb her to think of Nat sharing the reading lessons? Kit wondered, trying to be reasonable. How many of his visits had she missed? She was a little jealous to think of them all here cozily together, while she was hard at work in the cornfield. Annoyed at herself, she picked up the sailed wrap bundle. He sent you a present, though, she told Hannah brightly. Hannah ruefully surveyed the length of gray woolen. Now isn't that kind of Nat, she exclaimed. So soft and tight woven. Much too fine for the likes of me. But thee knows, the truth is these old eyes of mine can't even see to thread a needle. Then Prudence and I will make you a dress, promised Kit blithely. Can you so truly, demanded Prudence, overwhelmed at still another accomplishment. Of course I can sew. I have never made a woolen dress, but I learned to embroider before I was your age. I'll borrow a pattern and scissors from Mercy, and you'll see. While the reading lesson began, Kit spread the cloth on the floor, turning it this way and that as she had seen Mercy do, trying to plan how to use the length to the best advantage. The idea of cutting and sewing a dress by herself was novel and exciting. Will you really let me sew some stitches? asked Prudence, watching her with shining eyes. Really and truly, promised Kit, smiling back at her. What fun it would be to make something warm and pretty for Prudence, she thought with longing. Did they never give the child anything decent to wear? Those skimpy sleeves did not even cover her elbows, and the scratchy, linsey woolsey cloth kept her thin shoulders constantly twitching. She knew she could never give Prudence even the smallest gift. The lessons were risky enough. Looking at the child, Kit felt again a fleeting uneasiness. What misery would be the child's lot if these meetings were discovered? The miracle that had been taking place before their eyes had made it all too easy to forget the danger. For Prudence was an entirely different child from the woe-begone, shrinking creature who had stood in the roadway outside the school. The tight little bud that was the real Prudence had steadily opened its petals in the sunshine of Kit's friendship and Hannah's gentle affection. Her mind was quick and eager. She had memorized the horn book in a few days' time and sped through the primer. After that, she had plunged headlong into the only other reading matter available, Hannah's tattered Bible. Kit had chosen the Psalms to begin with, and slowly, syllable by syllable, Prudence was spelling out the lines while Hannah sat listening, her own lips often moving with the child in the lines she remembered and could no longer read. There were days on end, of course, when Kit could not manage to keep the tryst. But Hannah and Prudence were fast friends now, and she knew that the reading went companionably on. There were more frequent days when Prudence could not escape her mother's sharp eye, and other days when her small face looked so pinched and exhausted that Kit wondered painfully if the child had been punished for tasks she had left unfinished. Always before, she had been able to shake off her doubts, 
But today, she had too sharp a lesson in the retribution of this Puritan colony. For the first time, she felt a twinge of real fear. Hannah, she said softly over Prudence's head, I'm afraid to go on like this. What would happen if they found us out? Nat is strong enough to take it. But Prudence? Yes, agreed Hannah quietly. I know that soon thee would begin to consider that. What should I do, Hannah? Has thee looked for an answer? Prudence looked up. You won't say I can't come, Kit, she pleaded. I, I don't care what they do to me. I can stand anything. If only you'll let me come. Of course you can come, said Kit, stooping to give the child a reassuring hug. We'll find an answer somehow. Look now, I brought you a present too. From her pocket, she drew three precious objects that had required some ingenuity to gather. A partly used copy book from her trunk, a small bottle of ink, and a quill pen. "'Tis high time you learned to write,' she said. "'Oh, Kit, now, this very minute?' "'This very minute. Watch me carefully.' Opening to a clean page, she carefully wrote the child's name on the first line. P-R-U-D-E-N-C-E. -E. Now see if you can copy that. The small hand trembled so that the first eager stroke sent a great blob of ink sprawling across the page. Prudence raised stricken eyes. Oh, Kit, I've spoiled your lovely book. Tis no matter. You should see the great blots I used to make. Now, very carefully. Finally, it was completely written. Prudence, in quite respectable letters without a single blot. Prudence was awestruck at her own handiwork. Hannah came to peer closely and admire. Let me do it again, pleaded the child. This time, I won't make the R so wiggly. She grasped the quill in tense, careful fingers, and her lips silently formed each letter as she traced the lines. Over her bent head, Kit and Hannah exchanged an affectionate smile. For a time, they both sat listening to the small sounds in the house. The scratching of the pen, the rustling and snapping of the fire, and the slow purr of the yellow cat. How peaceful it is, thought Kit lazily stretching her toes nearer to the blaze. Why is it that even the fire in Hannah's hearth seems to have a special glow? Like the sunshine on the day that I sat on the new thatch with Ned. If only right now, on that bench across the hearth. But what ridiculous daydream was this? Kit shook herself upright. "'Tis too dark to work any more,' she said. Prudence laid down the quill with a long sigh, <sighs> and plopping down on the hearth, dragged the limp, drowsy cat into her arms. "'I wish I could live here with you and Pussy,' she said wistfully, laying her thin cheek against the soft golden fur. "'I wish thee could too, child,' said Hannah gently." Remember, Nat said it was like the psalm I was reading that day, the child said dreamily. Peace be within thy walls. Well, Kit interrupted too briskly, there won't be any peace anywhere if we don't get home in a hurry. She flung open the cottage door, and a bit of milkweed whisked in on the rush of November wind, spilling shreds of spidery white down. Prudence ran back to fling her arms about Hannah. Kit would remember many times the picture she carried with her along the darkening road. Was there some premonition, she would wonder, that made that moment so poignant? Some foreknowledge that this was the last afternoon the three would spend together in the small cottage. She would remember, too, that all the way home, she tried without success to find the answer that Hannah had promised could always be found in her own heart. Rachel greeted her reproachfully. 
You're very late, Kit. It was wrong of you to stay away from lecture. Your uncle was very displeased. And John Holbrook walked back with us to say goodbye to you and Mercy. Goodbye? Where is John going? Rachel looked across the room at Judith, who was setting the table near the fire. But Judith, her eyes red from weeping, said nothing. What has happened, Aunt Rachel? asked Kit, bewildered. John has enlisted in the militia. There's a detachment going out from Hartford to aid some of the towns north of Hadley in Massachusetts against the Indian attacks, and John volunteered to go with them. To fight? Kit was too astonished to be tactful. Why, John is the last person I'd think to be a soldier. Tis a doctor they need, and John has learned a good deal of medicine this year. But why now, right in the middle of his studies? I think it was his way of breaking with Dr. Bulkley, explained Rachel. He has tried so hard, poor boy, to reconcile Gershom's ideas with his own upbringing. Now it seems the doctor is going to publish a treatise in favor of Governor Andros and the new government, and John just couldn't stomach it any longer. We all think it is to his credit. I don't, spoke up Judith. I think it is nothing but stubbornness. That's not fair, Judith. Mercy spoke from the hearth. She looked a little more pale and tired than usual. I think you should be proud of him. Well, I'm not, answered Judith. What difference does it make what Dr. Bulkley writes? Now John won't get a church of his own, and he can never get married or build a house. Her tears broke out afresh. He'll come back, Rachel reminded her. The trip was only to be for a few weeks. He'll be gone for Christmas. If he cared anything about me, he wouldn't have gone at all. For shame, Judith, said her mother. You'd better dry those tears before your father comes in. Mercy spoke thoughtfully. Try to understand, Judith, she said slowly. Sometimes it isn't that a man doesn't care. Sometimes he has to prove something to himself. I don't think John wanted to go away. I think somehow he had to. Judith had shut her mind to any consolation. I don't know what you're talking about, she snapped. All I know is we were perfectly happy, and now he has spoiled everything. And we'll finish here and start chapter 17 in the next video. Thank you so much for listening. I love you guys. As Tigger says, ta-ta for now. Bye-bye.